But we're in an Olympic year. Uh, this summer, countries from around the world are, are going to gather in Paris uh, and the surrounding areas are going to be competing in over 300 events in almost 40 different sports. Now, I've shared before how much of a sports fan I am, so you can imagine how much I like Olympic years as well. It's always so much fun watching all these different athletes competing. And for some, it's the only time that they'll ever reach this pinnacle. And because of that, the heart that they compete with is, is compelled. Most of these athletes are competing for more than just themselves, and that's what truly makes it uh, special to me. Most of them are competing for something that they consider bigger than themselves. Yes, they want to do well individually. They, they want success. Some may even want to want to say that they want glory. But they want to do their best for their country as well. It's bigger than just them. They're playing on behalf of themselves, but they're also, and most importantly, representing their country. In, in regards to the U.S. team, that, that USA across the chest of the U.S. athletes, for the most part, means a whole lot more to most of them than the name on the back of the jersey. There are exceptions, obviously, to that, but for the most part, most are playing for a team, a country, something bigger than themselves. And that's what truly seems to make it a special uh, time. I've shared this with you before, but there's a great example of the, this Olympic spirit that took place back before I was born. Uh, the 1980 U.S. men's hockey team that beat the Soviet Union team in, in Lake Placid, New York. It's a great example. It's the perfect example of this Olympic spirit. The Soviet team uh, had been dominating the hockey world for over 20 years at this point. No one thought that was going to change at the time. But Herb Brooks was tasked with putting together the U.S. hockey team uh, for those games. And to say that he did so in a very untraditional way is an understatement. But in the end, his method worked. And the U.S. team of young amateur college players went on to defeat the Soviet professionals in the semifinals uh, of the Olympics in what's now known as the Miracle on Ice. Uh, they went on to win the gold as well. And if you're familiar with it, the movie Miracle Chronicles that tell. But as Herb was putting uh, this team together, he would actually go on to cut some of the more talented players. He wanted players that would play as a team. He didn't care as much about individual talent. But even after he selected this team, there was still a lot of animosity among the players. They had played so long against each other at rival universities that they were having a hard time coming together. At their first practice, he asked them each for their name, where they're from, and who they play for. And to a man, they give their name, where they're from, and the university that they play college hockey for. He wants them to realize that they now play for the U.S. together, not against each other. But that was a lesson that they had to learn on their own. And it all culminates when they're playing in, in Europe in some warm-up games. The team has a, a horrible night on the ice. They don't play hard. They don't play together. He even sees some of the players while they're on the bench. They're caring more about some pretty women in the stands than they are the game and their own teammates on the ice. And he's had enough. He makes them skate, go line to goal line over and over and over again after the game is over. They're already worn out at this point. The trainers, the assistant coaches, they're begging her to stop, but he keeps going. And then almost in desperation, just before they're all about to collapse in exhaustion, the eventual team captain, Michael Ruzioni, yells out, Michael Ruzioni, Windsor, Massachusetts. Coach Brooks looks at him and asks him, who do you play for? And this time, instead of his university, he responds, the United States of America. 
Brooks dismisses the team with, and that's all, gentlemen. There's a line from Brooks in the middle of the drill that stands out. It's probably the most famous line in the whole movie outside of the ending, Do You Believe in Miracles? And that is, the name on the front of the jersey is a whole lot more important than the name on the back. The name on the front of the jersey is a whole lot more important than the name on the back. And it was at that moment when they felt like they were going to die because of the workout that they were being put through, that it finally clicked. They played for the USA now. Not their respective colleges. But, but here's the thing as well. As much as that was a turning point and, and the moment that they truly became a team, it wasn't just smooth sailing from that point on. They still had their rough moments. and In fact, it... It just a few days before the Olympic Games actually started, they played the same Soviet group in an exhibition game and got absolutely demolished. So we're continuing this look at, at the ecclesia. We said last week that the Greek word that we get our name for church. That's where we get ecclesia from. We get the name church. There's a lot more to it than that. And I want to go back through some of this definition. I've cut it down some this week. But what we're talking about is the whole body of Christians scattered throughout the earth. The whole body of Christians. The ecclesia. R.C. Sproul stated this when he's talking about the word ecclesia. He said, this word is made up of a prefix and a root. The prefix is ek or ex, which means out of or from. And then the root word is a form of the verb kaleo, which means to call. So thus ecclesia means... Those who are the called out ones. Simply put, the invisible church, the true church, is composed of those who are called by God, not only outwardly, but inwardly by the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus calls someone to discipleship, He's calling that person to Himself, to belong to Him, to follow Him, and to learn from Him and of Him. So what we're talking about is, is the church, Big C Church. As in the people that make up the church around the world. It's not about a building. It's not about even a service. It's about people that, because of Christ, have been called out of society and are trying to follow Him to the best of their ability. Together. And it's that word together that we're going to focus on this morning. The ecclesia is meant to be one body. Yes, we're different, but we're one. As we get started with this today, I, I want to go back to the early church. You know, the start of the Ecclesia. Last week we, we talked about the foundation, and that foundation being the belief and the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that the foundation of the church, and that that was the foundation of the church at large. And it's that foundation that should bring us together. And then after his death and his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven, his apostles started the church. They became the ecclesia that, that he was talking about. In Acts 2, we, we get to see a picture of what this early church looked like. In verses 42 through 47, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So these, these four practices that are mentioned here, teaching, fellowship, the, the breaking of bread, and prayer, it gives us a little bit of an insight as to the priorities of the early church. They provide the early Christianity. These same practices that were mentioned there should be considered normal for 
the church today. The apostles' teaching was probably very similar to what Peter's message was at Pentecost. And that's to say it focused on making Christ known by appealing to eyewitness testimony and the prophecies from the Old Testament. And early Christians gathered together regularly for edification, for prayer, and for exhortation. And then the breaking of bread included fellowship meals and participation in the Lord's Supper. Something that we should all be doing regularly together. As part of their fellowship, the, the early church practiced a community of, of goods for a short time. The, the distribution of, of, uh, to the members of the faith community took place according to individual need. Now, this practice didn't last for a, a long time, likely because logistically it was difficult and as humans do, there was potential abuse with it. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go back to this type of community where, where everything is shared all the time, but we do need to be taking care of our own. If someone truly has a need, the Ecclesia should be striving to help that person out to the best of our ability. And one other, other thing that we see in this section is that the early church was an evangelizing church. Luke recorded that every day the Lord added to those who were being saved. Now he didn't tell us necessarily how that took place, but it makes sense that evangelism took place primarily through their gathering uh, of Christians in the temple and in individual houses. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ was at the heart of the early Christian preaching, which called for immediate response from anyone who listened. What's important in all of this is that they were together physically, but they were also together in their mission. They understood that what held them together was Christ and Him crucified. No matter what, was coming their way, they were the ecclesia. They were a community. They took care of one another and they made it a priority to bring others into that community as much as possible. Now as the church expanded from there, this, this was when they were all still right there in Jerusalem together. And as the church expanded, Paul really emphasized this idea of togetherness, this idea of unity. We have different functions. We're different. We have different jobs in the body of Christ. We're different parts of the same ecclesia, though. We're the same, and those parts have to function well together, or the ecclesia isn't what it's supposed to be. In Romans 12, verses 3 through 8, Paul tells us, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, Use it in service, if teaching and teaching, if exhorting and exhortation, giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. <coughs> there are seven gifts listed here, and that's not a comprehensive list. There are other gifts mentioned throughout the New Testament. The prophesying, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership. Showing mercy. And he says, in accordance to your faith. Which is another gift that is given. We're all to be using and utilizing these gifts in the ecclesia together. He says in verse 6 there, according to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. In other words, we all have a gift. We all have something that we need to be utilizing for the body of Christ. We're a body of believers and in that sense we function as a body. We each have a job to do 
And we can't function correctly if someone doesn't do their part. My wife just had her gallbladder out. I didn't, didn't even have this in my nose, but I just thought of it. My wife just had her gallbladder out, a, a part of her body that wasn't functioning well, probably for the last 12 or 14 years. It got removed, and she's starting to feel better, thankfully, from that. But when parts don't work correctly, the whole body suffers. That's the thing is none of us are more important than, than anyone else. That's the other thing that we have to, to realize that we can't act like we are. Romans 12, 3 there, he says, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. And that right there is the reason that this ragtag group of people can truly function together as one. If we realize that none of us is any more important than the other, then we lay aside our egos and we become the ecclesia that we're supposed to be. And we do that by looking at the foundation that we talked about last week. What brings us together in the first place? And that's Jesus and Him crucified. We are one under Christ and when we keep that in mind, everything else just kind of falls into place. And then later in Ephesians, Paul, really in the whole book of Ephesians, he's focusing on this idea of unity, on this idea of togetherness. And I think it's a great reminder for all of us that unity in the body of Christ, that unity in the ecclesia should be the utmost importance. William Barclay in his commentary on Ephesians uh, and leading into chapter 4, he says, before we begin this chapter, let us again remind ourselves that the central thought of the letter is that Jesus has brought to a disunited world the way to unity. This way is through faith in Him, and it is the church's task to proclaim this message to all the world. And now Paul turns to the character of, that Christians must have if the church is to fulfill the great task of being Christ's instrument of the universal reconciliation between individuals and between those same individuals and God within the world. We're going to look at, at Ephesians 4 uh, in a couple of different sections. We're not going to look at the whole chapter, but to begin with just Ephesians 4 verse 1 through 6. He says, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. He says we've received a calling. In our sports analogy, we've been picked to be part of the team. That invitation, by the way, is open to all. But those of us that have chosen to accept Christ have been called to be part of the team. And that calling is for unity through humility, through gentleness, through patience, and in agape love for others, that, that God-like love for others. Did you know that, that humility is, is actually a virtue when it's talking about following Christ? But before Christianity came about, it was not looked upon as a good characteristic. And in fact... There is not a Greek word for humility that doesn't have a negative connotation to it. But in Christ we are to be humble, which means that we are thinking of the well-being of others before we think of ourselves. And to the world that looks ridiculous. But in following Christ, that's exactly what we're called to do. Paul here insisted that a believer's behavior must be worthy of His divine calling. That humility, gentleness, and patience are absolutely essential if, you if unity is to be maintained. 
says that believers have the responsibility to keep unity in the body of Christ. And then he goes on and he has seven ones that are listed in these verses that, that constitute the, the foundation on which God creates this oneness in the church. Paul's plan can be seen from the vantage point of, of the work of the one spirit creating one body, the one Lord Jesus Christ creating one hope, one faith, one baptism, and then the one God, the Father, bringing about one people of God. One God and Father of all reminds us that God's oneness defines the church's oneness. He shows us here, Paul shows us what the basis for Christian unity is. That there is one body. Christ is the head. Christ is the head and the, the church is one body and we are not and cannot function separate. Just like our physical bodies have to be in communication with our head, with our brain to function, we as a whole have to be in communication with Christ and we cannot try to function on our own. There is one spirit which we cannot function without even. We desperately need the Holy Spirit which is available to us individually through confession and repentance and baptism. But collectively, we have to rely on the Spirit as well. There is one hope in our calling. We're all proceeding, should be, proceeding toward the same goal. Our methods, our organization, even some of our beliefs may be a little different, but we're all striving toward the one goal of a world redeemed by Christ. There is one Lord. And the Greek word for Lord here was used for a master as distinct from servant or slave. And it was the regular way of referring to the Roman emperor at the time. Christians are joined together because we are all in the possession of and in the service of the one master and king. You see, we're not only, we not only declare and accept Jesus as Savior, we declare Him Lord, which is to make Him King of our lives. And if we serve the same King, then we need to do so in unity. As I ended last week, all hell, King Jesus. There's one faith, and in this, Paul is meaning that the Christians are bound together because they have made this common act of complete surrender to the love of Jesus Christ. There's one baptism, a decision made on your own to publicly confess Christ through immersion. And there was only one way for a Roman soldier at this time to join the, the Roman army, and that was he had to take the oath that he would be true forever to his emperor. And similarly, there's only one way to enter the Christian church. The way of public confession of Jesus Christ and accepting the Holy Spirit through baptism. And finally, there is one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. One Father. We're all family. And those of us that have accepted this gift of salvation should be united under God as family. Paul continues, verses 7 through 16, he says, Now, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, Christ. From Him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love 
by the proper working of each individual part. See in verse eight here, he's actually referring to Psalm one, or sorry, Psalm sixty-eight, verse eighteen. But there's a significant difference from the original psalm versus what Paul says. In the original, it's talking about a conquering king, king coming back to Jerusalem with his prisoners in tow and demanding that gifts be given to him because of his victory. But Paul changes it to, to talk about Jesus being victorious, and through his victory, he's now giving us gifts. These gifts that are mentioned here are different than the spiritual gifts that Paul writes about in, in Romans and also in 1 Corinthians that we're, we're not looking at today. But these are about functions in the church. Not everybody gets these gifts, but everyone benefits from these gifts. This section here also tells us one of the main things that the ministers and, and teachers are still tasked with today, equipping the saints for the work of ministry and building up the body of Christ. So in that sense, our, our job is to help prepare all of us to go out and share the gospel work and to do the work of ministry alongside each other. But verses 13 through 16 are, are the focus. This is all done in an effort to reach unity and the faith. And like we said, working through the, this first section of the chapter, that doesn't happen until we're able to lay self aside and we care more about the other person than we do about ourselves. In other words, to be a mature Christian and live in unity with others, we have to put on the name of Christ. We have to care more about the name on the front of the jersey than we do the back, so to speak. We will be sound in our doctrine then and, and not let others confuse us with what we know. The, the, the aim of the church is nothing less that its members should reach a, a stature which can be measured with the fullness of Christ. The aim of the church is nothing less than to produce men and women who have in them the reflection of Jesus himself. It's been said that a, a Christian is to be someone in whom Christ lives again. And that's what the church members really ought to be. I think most of this really can be summed up with, with letting go of self and caring more about the other person. It's then and only then that we, we start to function as a true team, as one body. It's only then that we will have true Christian unity with one another. And that should be our goal. The goal is to become a team that cares more about the name on the front than the name on our back. Even when we do that, though, there's still going to be hiccups. There's still going to be times that we mess it up because guess what? We're human. We're going to get it wrong. We're going to fail. We're going to disagree with others. But in having those discussions in love and with grace, that's how we're going to get through them. Going back to the U.S. hockey team finally coming together, they still had their ups and downs. But the goal is to just improve daily. Become more and more like Jesus. Look more and more like Him. Be known more and more as a Christ follower by being different than the world around. I've been blessed enough in my life to see this unity play out in, in a few different ways. As I wrap up this morning, I want to go back to, to my teen years for a few minutes. Yeah, a friend of mine sent me this picture earlier this week. It was posted online, and then he made sure he zoomed in on me as an 18-year-old high school kid. Uh, I told him when he sent that, yeah, when I had hair, it still had 10 toes. But... <laughs> I grew up in a church in East Tennessee that had a thriving youth group. And we would normally run anywhere from 50 to 70 uh, teens on a Wednesday night. And this was junior and senior high combined. Uh, but trips like Tennessee Christian Teen Convention, uh, we could be 
even up into the 90s uh, for some of those trips. And when my class entered seventh grade, we, we had a good number of students. This was most of us that graduated together. There's a, a couple of that weren't there the whole time, but they were, were there at the end. Uh, but we had a good number of students. We knew each other pretty well. And one of the first things that we noticed when we entered that youth group is that as a whole, it was very segmented and very click filled And we didn't like that. We, we wanted to change that, uh, but it took a while. And it wasn't just my class that was able to do this. We, we had other strong leaders in other age groups that, that helped with these issues. But by the time we were in ninth grade, it was starting to become a unified group. We were all from different schools. Uh, we lived in different towns in our area. We had different interests outside of church and outside of youth group. But we had Christ in common. And that was the driving factor of who we were and what we were about. And it was those years in that group of unified Christians that helped me lay the foundation for me to grow into the Christ follower I am today. And it was that unified group that surrounded me and supported me as a 15-year-old when my dad died unexpected. It was that group that three years later I went before at a week of church camp and committed my life to full-time ministry. But like many other times, there were hiccups. When I graduated from youth group and we moved on into our college-age uh, classes at that church, those cliques that were present at the beginning of our youth group time had reformed. I felt out of place. People seemed to care more about their group of friends than they did the whole. And it caused me to actually start pulling away. My attendance at church dwindled. My relationship with Christ suffered. And it took a few years and a lot of painful growth, but I eventually found my way back. And I've talked about that before as well. I don't have time to go into it this morning. But that is why unity is so important to me. I've seen it. I've lived it out. I've seen the good that it can do when it's there. And I've seen the bad that can happen when it's not. And when we don't live in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, the body as a whole suffers. But we do individually as well. It's time we start caring more about the name on the front of the jersey than we do the back. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ, and we thank you that that, that he is what unifies us, that can bring us together. God, and when we have that in common, then nothing else really should matter, that we should be trying to follow Christ with everything that we have. God, and when we do get it wrong, and we, we don't always get along with each other. Help us to, to come back together. Help us to repent of that and to, to truly be united under you, under his sacrifice. God, may we live a life that's worthy of that sacrifice because it's only that that gives us a chance. God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Maybe if you maybe you've never felt that kind of unity that we're talking about. Because you've never given your life to Jesus as Savior and Lord. And it, I'll be the first one to tell you it's not a guarantee of an easy life. In fact, it's hard. It's hard to follow him. It's hard to become more like him. Others around you won't necessarily understand, but what I can promise is it's worth it. Because once you truly, fully surrender to Him, you're able to put off that old self and become a new creation. You're able to start caring more about others than you do yourself. You're able to find unity in a group of like-minded people doing their best to follow Him. And also, maybe you haven't found that unity because even though you surrendered to Him, you haven't completely allowed Him to help you put off that old self. And you can make that decision right where you are. But, but I want you, if you want to come forward and make that public, we encourage you to do so as well. Any decision, now is the time as we stand and sing. It's going to be a video this morning.